All right. I am going to open my Bible here. All right, so we're talking about ministering to people in multiple dimensions. This material that we're talking about um, is really... John Wimber developed a lot of this uh, roughly 45 or 50 years ago. It doesn't mean that it's out of date. It does mean that you may not have heard it because not many people are teaching this stuff these days. I worked on a lot of this with him, and, um, and I more or less brought it back um, with some updated insights and things, which I have cleared with Carol Wimber on multiple occasions. Uh, one time I said to her, Carol, I'm afraid I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going, you, you actually are need not, not allowed to say what I want to say right now because of the way things are in our society. But I, I'm afraid that I'm wandering away from what, you know, John would have wanted. That's a, that's a very uh, plain way of saying it. And she said, no, 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 you, you, you're just taking it to the next level. Keep on going. So I've gone back to her eight or nine times with that same question, and she keeps saying, keep going, keep going. So here we go. Um, the gospel, in the, in the New Testament, the gospel writer John the Apostle, he also wrote three letters. Um, if you're of an older generation, you would know them as epistles, not letters. But whatever you call them, uh, they are short little books. And in the third one that he wrote called Third John, it's a clever title, don't you think? Um, in verse 2, it says, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. Now, that is a very dense statement. Um, it starts with the idea of all who are reading this are among the beloved. That's an interesting concept right there, that, that God loves us. I mean, these people are not just beloved by John, they're beloved by God the Father. And he's calling them the beloved because with the Father's love, he loves them as this you know, early apostle of the church. He says, I pray that in all respects, that means in every way possible. That's what all respects means. That in every way possible, you may prosper. Now, a lot of people have taken that to mean monetarily. And I wouldn't deny that there's a monetary dimension to it. I think God wants to bless us, at least to the point where we're not starving and eating junky food and you know, living in unsafe housing and so forth. Um, I don't know about you know, having huge estates and all the rest of it that sometimes people take it to. But Abraham seemed to have some dimension of that. Isaac, it says, became very rich. And uh, so maybe there's more to that than meets the eye. But that's not really my focus tonight, and I don't want to get bogged down in it. But anyway, John prayed that they would prosper. Now, prosper doesn't just mean financially. It means to uh, do well, to get ahead. We might call it fatness of soul. And so when we think about prospering, we should absolutely be thinking beyond merely monetary things, whether or not we include them. And then he says, and be in good health. Now, for a lot of us, we hear that and we think specifically physical health, and for sure that's included. So you're not off the mark if that's what you're thinking. But to be in good health, there's mental health, there's sexual health, there's emotional health. There's a whole bunch of these dimensions that are included in this. And John is saying, I pray that in every way possible, you would find fatness of soul and increase. That's probably a good modern English way of saying it. Even as your soul prospers, which could be read two ways. One, uh, your soul is prospering. And so you should also have this be true in your life. Or it could mean, to the degree that your soul is prospering, anyone know the old hymn, It is Well With My Soul? To the degree that it is well with my soul, these other things will flow out of that wellness, that wholeness, that wholesomeness, that holiness. Because holiness is wholesomeness is wholeness. So... That, as I said, is a very dense and rich verse. I could do an entire sermon on just that verse, but uh, time will not permit that, so we'll just move on and leave it with this idea that John the Apostle, who was the one that Jesus you know, called the beloved apostle, the one who rested his head on Jesus' chest or breast, if you prefer, uh, at the Last Supper, 
That John, who knew Jesus well, prayed this prayer, which means he had the mind of Christ. And what that should tell you is, if you don't have a belief that God wants you to prosper, and we might say thrive, maybe that's an easier word for us to swallow. If you don't have the understanding that God wants you to thrive, something's wrong with your Christology, something's wrong with your pneumatology, something's wrong with your Christianity. And a lot of people still live in this kind of, God wants me to suffer, God wants me to be beaten down, and, and usually they drag out the trope, what about the martyrs in China? Nobody ever said persecution won't go away. Uh, in America, we've been spared it for a long time, although, warning, it's coming soon. But anyway, we won't get down that path right now. But that's, that's when persecution comes, of course, these things can be taken away from you. But that doesn't mean it's the intention of God that they be taken away from you. It means that because of the fallenness and sinfulness of mankind, things happen where people are persecuted and treated violently and irreverently. And so that doesn't mean it's the will of God any more than rape is the will of God, any more than war is the will of God. So we have to, first of all, frame our thinking. We've got to frame our thinking and understand that God is good. And when God commands something or God intends something, the entire reason for it is for our benefit because he loves us. Now, obviously, if we go wide of the mark, there might be some problems, but that's not on him, that's on us. If we follow in his footsteps, if we run in the paths of his commands, then we actually should anticipate, expect that there will be the blessing of God upon our lives. And if you look at the stories of people like Abraham, Isaac, David, Solomon, there are many examples in Scripture of people who thrived under the blessing of God. And that's really where John is trying to take this to. So if you came in here tonight with the idea that, well, you know, maybe God wants it to be bad. I'm not saying the Lord can't discipline us, but usually discipline is administered when we've done something wrong. But always discipline, if it's done lovingly, and every parent knows this, is intended for correction. It's not intended to be the normal state of nature. And once the issue has been addressed, we kind of go back to the happy, fun-loving family that we should all be living in. I am aware many do not. <clears throat> all right, so God desires for us to be whole people. And not only in our physical health, but in every dimension of what it means to be human. And so when we think about the excitement or the joy of experiencing healing in our own life or our own body, in our own person through the grace of God, that can be overwhelming. But it's even more powerful when you become a healing agent and God begins delivering healing to other people through you. And so to see God touching people and making them whole and, to, uh, and for you yourself to be part of that, this is one of the greatest thrills on earth. Now, I, I'm saying this because, because really what this is about at this, at this point in the talk is about hunger for God. It, it, there's a hunger to be used by God. There's a hunger to see the hand of God extended. There's a hunger to see people liberated. There's a hunger to live the life that we see in the Gospels and Acts um, in the lives of people. There's a hunger to step into that. And if you came in tonight kind of like, yeah, hit me up, show me what you got, that's not spiritual hunger. And so what, what's going to happen is like the parable of the sower, the seed is going to fall on rocky soil, and you'll walk out of here and you won't get anything out of it. So, beloved, pray to get hungry, right? John said, I pray that in all respects you're, you may prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. Well, I'm going to say right behind it, beloved, pray to get hungry. So if you came in here tonight and you're not actually hungry to see that, you may not see very much of it because Jesus said that those who hunger will be filled, right? So to be filled, you need to start with hunger. And that begins with alignment with what God intends. When we see this is the purpose of God and we realize we can be agents of that healing, of that transformation for people, that will tend to reprioritize your life and many of the things that have taken up your time, energy, and money to have been the focus of your life, they will fall away. What is the old hymn? Turn your eyes on Jesus, 
look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I'm looking at my friend John Burke there in row three, over here on my left, right side. He was with me in Germany uh, in March, and um, I would say he got lit up. <laughs> but he went there hungry, and he went there wanting to see God use him, and the Lord used him profoundly on that ministry trip. And you know, somewhere in the whole process, a lot of the things that the world wants to throw at us and cause us to be fixated on became deprioritized in John's life. And what really became prioritized is, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So this is really at the core of what makes this whole thing work. So God has invited us to share in the fulfillment of his own desires on earth, rebuilding broken lives, loving people who are unloved, feeding the hungry, giving to the poor, strengthening the weak, healing the sick, setting captives free, whether it's to sexual bondage or mental illness or whatever it may be, um, freeing those bound and tormented by evil spirits. Anybody see uh, Greg Locke's movie, Come Out in Jesus' Name? Didn't make it up here, huh? You should, you should look it up online. It's an interesting movie. It's, it's a good movie. I like it. Um, anyway, so setting people free of demons that might be tormenting them, um, encouraging those who are weak in their faith, even raising the dead. I mean, there's so many dimensions that this looks like. And what starts to happen as you step into this and lean into it and pursue it diligently is it starts to become your normal. It starts to become part of your everyday lifestyle and suddenly you actually are living a life that looks like the Bible. And most Christians today don't actually live lives yet that, that really reflect the Bible. So doing all these things is a privilege, but it's also a responsibility. And so God has put responsibility on us to carry out his kingdom mandate. We must see the world the way God sees it. We have to look at it from his perspective. Jesus said that in order to see the kingdom come, you must repent. The word repent means to change your mindset or change your mind, if you will. Uh, but, but what is that all about? You're not actually gaining some new avant-garde progressive perspective. What you're really doing is shedding the encrustation, the callus that's on your mind or on your heart that keeps you from thinking about the world the way God does. And with that, the new way of thinking is actually the old way of thinking that's embedded in these pages. And as we rediscover those truths, they come to life because, as somebody once said, your words are spirit and life. Does that make sense? And for that, we actually have to return to the scriptures. It's not enough just to stand up here and talk about them. So we'll be looking at a lot of scripture this weekend. Some of you, your eyes are going to glaze over. And I will also say this, I hope you have an honest-to-God paper Bible. You can have leather covers or cardboard, I don't care about that, but you need a paper, there we go, Dr. Anna has pulled out her paper Bible. Uh, you need one of those because you don't retain truth as well off a screen as you do from a page. This has been proven over and over again in many studies on human learning. So we have to see the world the way God sees it. We get that perspective from his word. If he was so moved by the plight of man that he gave his only son to save us, then it behooves us, who are called by his name, to reach out and do the same. But this demands sacrifice, specifically in the form of time. It might include energy and it could include money, but it will always include your time. So what I'm telling you up front to be very clear is if you're going to enter into this journey, your life is about to get upended. You will not be watching Survivor every single night, nor will you be watching American Idol or whatever, Antique Roadshow. I don't pick, pick whatever it is that you like to watch. And of course, it goes without saying that most of the more salacious content that's available on TV, that shouldn't even be coming through your screen. And if it is, the first thing to do is make sure you never watch any of that again. So there's a price to pay, but the rewards of seeing people made whole, of living a supernatural life, is, is well worth it. And so it's in the doing of all these things that uh, I am talking about that we discover how these things function. I can tell you that in, in my various journeys, I have a book coming out on June the 6th called On the Road with the Holy Spirit. 
um, A Modern Day Diary of Signs and Wonders. Many of the lessons I learned in that book, I might have been able to intuit them from the scripture, but it was really as I was in the doing for many years on the road that the Lord began to show me these things and I, and I began to understand the nuanced way that, that a lot of this works. So you have to roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty. And the more you learn through experience about, well, we'll just say healing broadly defined, then ultimately the less you feel like you know. Because it's a huge area and it seems like there's no end to it. But I will tell you, you will get to where you become more and more and more proficient and you start to see more and more people healed. I was uh, telling somebody while I was setting up the table this evening that before I came up here today, I met with a pastor that I know down in our area. He's a friend of mine that we don't go to his church. Um, but we meet from time to time, and he had long COVID and has had long COVID for a while. And um, he was telling me about his condition. And I said, have you heard my teaching on uh, praying for COVID? And he said, no, I haven't. I thought, well, that's kind of funny because, you know, he and I are close enough. You'd think he might have. But anyway, he hadn't. So I said, well, it sounds to me like you've got long COVID. And I said, let me pray for you. He goes, right here? I said, yeah, give me your hand. So we're sitting there at the table, and we, you know, we prayed. took a couple minutes. Um, and he, he had described very clearly what his conditions were, what his symptoms were. So when he and I parted ways about an hour later, uh, I sent him a text and I said, hey, how was it driving home? Because among other things, he was having uh, motion sickness while driving. Most people don't get it when they're driving, they get it when they're passenger. Um, and he was getting vertigo when he was driving. He had other things going on too. But he said, no problems at all. Everything is 100% clear. Well, that should be your normal. That should be your normal. I really want to say that. That should be your normal. Why? Because that was Jesus' normal. And the scriptures tell us, same author that gave us 3 John 2, said in the first letter of John, in this world we are to be like him. And if Jesus had been sitting at that table this morning, he would have said, long COVID, COVID schmovid. Let's take care of this right now. <laughs> and and I, again, I'm trying to shift mindsets here. I'm, I'm trying to help you realize what should this actually look like, sound like, feel like, in real time if you're going to live this life. So you're going to discover more as you do, and the first thing you'll discover is that healing is not a simplistic thing. So an understanding of these various ways in which healing comes into our lives, we can call them categories and operatives, uh, this will undergird our ministry. And so the things that I'll share this weekend are a mixture of the old um, that I learned from John and also what I've learned uh, through my own experiences uh, in ministry over the last many years, many more than I want to admit. So, uh, like John, let me just say this, I pray that indeed you may be healthy in every respect, and that the Lord will meet you, and that if he doesn't finish it tonight, that he'll begin a journey that maybe three weeks from now or a month or two months from now will be completed and that beyond that, you may be equipped to make um, others whole and perhaps even train them to do the same. Jesus said it's enough for the disciple to become like his master. Well, whoever you want to call your master, but pick somebody who's having some success. Try to emulate what they're doing. Now, I'm making some assumptions in everything we're going to do this weekend. Number one, you already have a theology for healing. I'm not going to present a theology of healing. They, I generally do that in the basic healing material because so many people come into an event not really believing that God wants to heal. So the first thing we've got to do is, uh, excuse the turn of phrase, get out the wrecking ball. <laughs> I know this crowd and I know this part of the country. Uh, get out the wrecking ball and knock over all that old theology about how God doesn't want to heal. So I won't present that apologetic. If you want it, uh, again, we have it on the table, uh, and in particular, you should look for, I didn't bring the discs, you could order it online, I have a, a series called God's Will is to Heal, that's pretty straightforward, um, but it's also available on the MP3 cards if you prefer to buy it that way. Um, so this is really a practical course designed to get you going with healing. So if you're still sitting there kind of going, well, I'm not totally sure about this, this actually might be too advanced of a class for you. It uh, doesn't mean you shouldn't get up and walk out, but you might struggle with some of what I'm going to say. 
But number two, you are already exercising some kind of ministry in the healing area. Now, some will be more slanted towards inner healing or perhaps deliverance, some for physical healing, some for sexual brokenness or mental health. There's a lot of dimensions, social restoration. Uh, but however you're doing it, you should already be trying because as you try, you will fail. And when you fail, you actually step into a learning posture because you always ask, what did, why didn't that work? What did I do wrong here? All right, number three, you should be part of a fellowship that encourages and exercises the practice of these things. Otherwise, what's going to happen is you're going to fill your head with facts. You're going to say, right, check the box. I went to the Ken Fish Intermediate Healing Seminar, and now I went back to my church, and I sit in the chair or the pew, and nothing has changed. That's not our objective at all. We, we absolutely want to shift things around. So uh, finally, you're open to exploring the dynamic interplay of these various categories of healing we're going to discuss. And so with that, let's talk about healing of the spirit. Now, the specific kind of healing we're talking about with this one is what we call sin sickness, sickness that arises from sin. And I'll just say this, American Christians don't have a very profound grasp on sin that's a function of both how we live and our theology, uh, which tends to be, I mean, on the one hand, it's good, it's slanted towards grace, but on the other hand, there is a problem in that we don't take sin, I would say, seriously enough. Now, there are people who have religious spirits, and they're always, like, obsessing and beating other people up. That's not what I mean by not taking it seriously enough. It's that we don't really think carefully enough about the profound nature of of the damage to the human system, whether your mind, whether your emotions, whether your physical body that has occurred as a result not only of the sin of Adam and Eve, but of the sin that you yourself, every single one of you has committed, me too, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, not even one. Don't worry, I'm not going to browbeat you. I'm just pointing this out. We do not think deeply enough about what that truth means in our lives, period. And there is, a, there is a profound, paralyzing effect that sin has, and ultimately it overtakes us and wins. That's why we die, right? God said to Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat of that fruit, you will surely die, but there was sin that came even after that because once they'd kind of breached the envelope, uh, and this is, this is really the way it was, human beings were made, think about this for a second, human beings were made by the Lord to live forever. We were made immortal. Now, we're not immortal on our own. We're immortal because we have the breath of God within us, the Spirit of God within us. Adam and Eve, we don't know how long they lived in, in the Garden of Eden. A long time, maybe. When you read Genesis, you might think on day six they were created, <laughs> and then they sinned maybe on day eight. <laughs> but I don't think so. I think they were around for quite a long time, and the devil was working on them, and eventually he got to them, and okay, the rest is history, as they say. Uh, but, but the natural state of human beings is to live forever. And so this is why we speak of restoration coming through the new birth when people are born again. And it should help us to understand that it is the intention of God that we would be returned to that state. That's why the promise of the gospel is when we die, we go to heaven, we live forever, we're given a new body that, that's imperishable. We are returned to that Adamic state of righteousness. That's really what is going on in the totality of, of the incarnation and the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus, the coming of the Spirit, the sanctification of our lives, and ultimately our glorification. Because Paul says those whom he called he justified, those whom he justified he also glorified. All right, so that's, that's kind of the, the broad picture. So we don't think deeply enough about sin and its effects. This is the first category we're going to cover tonight. We will cover the others tomorrow. Don't worry, I'm not going to completely bury you. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to first explain what I mean by this category of healing. We'll look at some case studies from Scripture. We'll talk about some 
real live uh, examples. And I'm going to do all this in, I'm not sure how much time, but I'll try and cram it all in. So um, remember this, when healing of the human spirit takes place, every other facet of human life will be affected. And if you want to think about a model of the human system, think of the human spirit as the center, and then out beyond that you've got the soul. And the soul, by the way, has three primary parts. We've got the, the will, we've got the intellect or the mind, and we've got the emotions. And all three of those interact with one another, and they also have interaction with the human spirit. And then out beyond that, we've got the human body, which is physical, and all of these can be affected uh, by sin. Now, modern science, medical science, tells us that perhaps as much as 80% of sickness that people experience is psychosomatic. Now, that doesn't mean it's made up, although when I was a kid, I remember my mother using that term in a rather derogatory way. And some of you that might be of roughly my vintage uh, would perhaps carry some of that same kind of prejudice against the idea of, of something being psychosomatic. But when we say psychosomatic, what we mean is the causal effects of that problem are not necessarily physical and they may not be visible. It doesn't mean they aren't real. It simply means they're not physical. And so when we're talking about this, this kind of ministering in, the, in all dimensions, ministering to the whole person, what I call integrated healing, we have to be ready to think beyond what presents to you outwardly. So when I was in business, um, management consultants like to say, the problem is rarely the problem. The problem is what they're complaining about, but the problem is actually something else that's going on somewhere in the company. And what consultants usually do is figure out what that something is. You are about to become a healing consultant. That's what you are going to do. Because people will come to you and they'll say, I have this problem. And you'll listen to them, and maybe 5% of the time, maybe 2% of the time, the problem is the problem. The other 95% or 98% of the time, the problem that they're complaining about is not the problem, but they want you to be the diagnostician who will figure out what is the problem and then fix it. That is, that is my life, literally. That is my entire life. Everywhere I go, people want to talk to me and they want to tell me about their problem. And they want me to fix it and explain to them you know, how it got there and how we're going to get rid of it and all that. And John, isn't that what we do every, everywhere we go, every city we went to in Germany? Isn't that what we were doing? It's we exactly what we do. And I saw the Yules walk in back there. Robert, isn't that what we do everywhere we go? Every prayer engagement that you have in the prayer room, the, our online prayer room? Yeah. That, that's, this is what we do. So if you are going to do this, you are going to have to learn to think diagnostically, and you've got to look beyond whatever is presenting on the surface. So as I like to say, think of a tree now, think of a, just a literal physical tree, but let's make it a fruit tree. I don't care if it's almonds, it might be a nut tree. It could be peaches, I like peaches, I like apricots better. But if you deal with the root, there will be no more fruit. And in this case, I don't mean good fruit like almonds and apricots or peaches, I mean the bitter fruit the sickness, the crazy in the head, the, 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 that, that so many people carry around in them all the time. The way you're going to get that taken care of is probably not to hit that thing straight on, is to figure out why is that there, where did that come from? And so the, the thing that we're talking about right now is this matter of sin sickness. So when we talk about healing of the spirit, this is the renewal and restoration of our spiritual life. Remember, when Adam and Eve died, God said they would die, but they apparently didn't drop dead on the spot, and so that could be confusing to some people. He said they'd die, but they didn't die. Well, they actually did die, but they died spiritually, and they were cut off from him. It says in Genesis, and, and some of this I'm not turning to the Scriptures if I were teaching an adult ed class over 20 weeks in, uh, on Wednesday nights at the church, I would literally take you to every single one of these scriptures and show it to you to ground you in it. If I'm going to do as much as I hope to do in four sessions this weekend, I can't possibly do that. So I'm, 
I'm hoping that you remember these passages, and I'm hoping that you will jot them down and maybe go look them up afterward as part of your own self-study. But it says that the Lord God breathed into Adam's nostrils. He gave him the ruach, or the pneuma in Greek, ruach is Hebrew, of God, and he became a living being. That's how he became a living being, because he had the spirit of God within him animating him and giving him life. And when Adam and Eve sinned, there was a cutting off of that. Obviously, some measure of it remained because Adam lived for 930 years before he died. But at the same time, he was now in decline, and he eventually was going to succumb to that. And that is what happens in the process of death. So ultimately, physical death came, but this is the issue. Renewal and restoration of our spiritual life, our relationship with God, all of this is not only an important thing, it's a necessary thing that we can live the life we're intended to have. This is why Jesus says, uh, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will, uh, will never die, and even if he dies, he will live. This is why we have verses like John 3.16, God so loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You say, well, but people still die after they receive Jesus. Right, but they're spiritually restored, and the Scripture tells us, 1 Corinthians 15, that when we, are, when we die, when we are raised, we will get a new and immortal body once again. So again, we are moving back towards the Adamic ideal that was lost in Eden. All right, so sickness of the Spirit is caused by our own individual sin, period. Our own individual sin. I am aware of sin in the world and the sin that comes to us from Adam and Eve. That's a problem of its own, but that's not the one we're talking about right now. And so the first and deepest kind of healing is forgiveness of sins, which Jesus provides in response to sincere repentance. Now, when we receive salvation, yes, we have healing in our spirit, um, but we also have the opportunity for an ongoing experience of his forgiveness, which continues to keep us spiritually healthy. A lot of Christians, though, don't walk in that. They become kind of hard and shriveled, or they live under condemnation, and they don't realize just how much God is willing to help them. During the Australian revival, there was one church I used to go to a couple times a year. As it were, it was on the circuit for me, and... Uh, there was this one woman there, and I'd, I'd met her at one point, and every time I met her, she would, she would take my hand, and she would either call me Pastor Ken or Brother Ken, and uh, she would say, whichever, Pastor Ken, uh, I just don't know how God can love me. I, I don't know how he could want to help me. I'm such a vile and horrible woman. And I would say, yeah, but he loves you because you're in his image and you're worthy of redemption. No, no, don't say that, Brother Ken, or Pastor Ken. I, you can't say that about me because I'm such a horrible woman. She literally lived in that place, and this was as a result of certain things that she had done at one time in her life for which she could not forgive herself and for which she could not receive the forgiveness of God. And so she was shriveled up on the inside, and what do you know? She was struggling with a myriad of physical conditions in her body all of which was emanating out of this self-hatred, this self-loathing that she carried. And presently, over a period of many prayer sessions and some counseling and a bit of rebuking, we, uh, we got her out of that hole and she got healed. But, but this is really a personification of the very dynamic I'm describing. So in Genesis chapter 3, we have a lengthy passage too long really to read tonight as much as I'd like to because there's power in the Word of God. Uh, Genesis 3, 1 to 24, the serpent was more crafty or subtle than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Well, crafty, that's a good word. Another one that goes right alongside of it is shrewd. He has an ulterior motive and he presents one way, but the other side of it is not so good. A lot of people get drawn into this kind of thing in life, and it has all kinds of faces to it. It might be drug use, it could be premature sexualization, alcohol abuse. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Being drawn, this is one I ran into in spades this week. Not allowed to say that one anymore either. I ran into this one in size this week. Um, 
uh, people who were tangled up in the occult. And, you know, they'd gotten involved in it because it seemed cool at the time, and they didn't even know that it was wrong, even though they were Christians. And now, at the tender young age of 31, uh, this individual, one of them anyway, has all these anxiety problems, insomnia, and on it goes. And so she was saying to me, what, what, why do I have this? And so I just stopped and I said, Lord, what is it? And I kind of knew, but I wanted to make sure I was on track. And yep, okay. And I said, who in your family was in the occult? <gasps> well, when I was a girl, I had a Ouija board and I played with tarot cards that my mother taught me how to use. And my grandmother used to cast star charts and was also involved in spiritualism, i.e. communing with the dead. I said, well, this is all why you have this problem with anxiety. So, but see, it's the beautiful side of evil. You, you don't even realize you're doing wrong. Well, I didn't know it was wrong at the time. I know you didn't know it was wrong. That doesn't mean it's not wrong. It just means you didn't know it was wrong. And this is one of the big offenses to the modern American mind. People think that if I didn't know it was wrong, I should get off the hook. And that's not the way the universe works, unfortunately. Okay, so this serpent, he's crafty. And he says to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And you know the, the dialogue here. I could read this whole passage. Uh, but the woman says, well, uh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but of this one tree in the midst of the garden, uh, you can't eat of it and you can't. And then she says, you can't touch of it. Touch it, lest you die. Well, the warning about death was there and not eating was there. The touching was a little rich, but anyway. Uh, and the serpent replies, you will not surely die. Now, on one level, maybe there is a, sh a shard of truth in that because she didn't drop dead when she ate the fruit. She would drop dead later. So there is a shard of truth. But spiritually, yes, she did die. And God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What did he seduce Eve with? the desire for knowledge that she didn't have, and the idea that God's holding something back from me or you. By the way, this is still the allure of Satan, and it is, I would say, the siren song of the modern age. Think about everything that's going on in high technology, space exploration, and more, and it all goes right back to this, the knowledge that you don't have that you're questing for. Does this make sense? Now, I'm not, I'm not opposed to learning, um, but I'm saying that there's knowledge that God never intended for us to have. And the knowledge of evil, he, re he withheld from humanity when he created Adam and Eve. We were never supposed to even know what evil was. And that was part of our immortality. But as soon as evil was known, well, now we begin to die. All right, so she sees that it's good uh, for food. It's a delight to look upon. She takes it. She eats of it. She gives it to her husband and uh, both of their eyes are opened, and they realize now that they are naked, and they sew fig leaves together. And then they hear the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And, you know, there's a lot of ways you could read this. You could hear that as, Where are you? Or you could hear, where are you? Or you could hear, where are you? Oh my gosh, every day we meet in the cool of the day and you're not here. You're missing the meeting. Oh my gosh, there's only one reason that you wouldn't be here. What has happened? Oh my God! This is the cry of a distressed parent whose child has wandered off at the fair or in the supermarket. Which voice do you hear? when you read this verse. Because I, I interpreted it the way maybe a, a, somebody in a play would do, three different ways with the sound of my voice, with my facial expressions, with my body language, which voice do you hear? Do you hear, where are you? If you do, you have a problem with sin sickness and you need healing from that because somehow you are still cut off from God even if you're born again. If you hear, where are you? That's sort of a, 
well, I care, but not that much. You're still somehow disconnected from the Lord. But if you hear the frantic voice of a father that's rushing up and down the aisles in the supermarket, where is my baby? Then you're probably in about the right zone with respect to your own walk with God. Because this is the most fundamental thing that we've got to deal with. I mean, all these other things matter, but as I said, they flow out of this healing of the Spirit. So he's calling out, where are you? And Adam says, well, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, who told you you were naked? Up until now, and it actually says it in Scripture, the man and his wife were naked and unashamed. And yet now they are ashamed, and they are afraid. And God knows, as only God could know, that if you are afraid and you are ashamed in your nakedness of meeting me, then only one way that could have happened. You ate the fruit that I said not to eat. And that's why he says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Now, did God do that because he was mean or because he was trying to withhold pleasure or because he was somehow doing something mean and nasty? If you have any of that in your mind, there's a problem right there too. And it again deals with this sickness of the spirit. Because the very reason the Lord God said, do not eat of this fruit, is because your eyes will be opened and you will know good from evil. And when you do that, your entire world will come crumbling down. That's what's going to happen. Isn't that what we tell our children? Don't take drugs. Don't have sex before marriage. We try to tell them, and then they do, and then look at what happens in their lives. Is that not what a good and loving parent would do? So again, if you don't hear that loving kind, I'm doing this for your own good, in all of this from God, something is fundamentally wrong in your relationship with the Lord. It's really quiet in here. So <laughs> the man blames the woman, and the woman blames the snake. I'm summarizing, not reading, because I'm trying to save a little time. And so then the Lord you know, speaks to the serpent and tells him, you're going to go on your belly, and uh, you'll be cursed all the days of your life. And then he speaks to Adam and Eve and tells them respectively that you'll bring forth food from the sweat of your brow, that was not the case previously, right? Previously, the, the earth just gave its goodness, and all they had to do was really pick it and tend the garden. And then for Eve, he talks about the difficulty of childbirth, uh, and he says, you are dust, and you will return to dust. So that physical death will ultimately overtake you. Well, this is really the, the substance of this passage, so I somewhat read it and somewhat interpreted it for you. Let's talk about what happens in this story. So prior to the eating of this fruit, whenever it happened, uh, they were spiritually healthy. They walked with God in the cool of the day. They didn't run from God. They ran to God. They, they loved him, and he loved them. And there was, a, there was a communion is the word we use, but we might say interchange or interaction or the ability to understand, uh, but there was, there was a synchronicity between God and God and mankind. Then they become tempted through their senses. First it's sight, look on the tree. Then touch, reach out and touch it. Then taste it. So the senses come into play. And there's pride, right? Pride because we're going to disregard what God has told us to do. And again, we don't know how many millions of years Adam and Eve may have walked with the Lord uh, before this fall event happened. And so they would have had a long history of establishing the very nature of the, of the God that they served and in whom, uh, whose, uh, in who, whose breath was in their body. Um, so they sinned through disobedience and they underestimated the subtle power, the cunning, the craftiness of the serpent. Um, this sin ultimately brings them shame and they're aware that they're naked, so they sew fig leaves together. It doesn't work so well, so actually the Lord, the first death that we see, full death, is of an animal that is killed, doesn't say what kind, and now they have skins to cover their bodies, and this becomes the first clothing that humans wear. But it's really to cover up their shame. 
Um, and so now the, uh, this sickness of the Spirit is bringing them guilt. And with guilt, they want to run and hide. They avoid. And so this is one of the things that you'll see in people who have guilt, uh, guilty consciences or guilt feelings uh, is they will try to avoid. They'll try to blame shift. They will try to hide. They'll hide in human interactions. They'll hide when they're talking to you. Anyone who's raised children knows what this looks like too. Um, and so all of this results in fear. So they're hiding from God, not just out of guilt, but out of fear. And so now we see that what's happened in their spirit, man or woman, is now contaminating their soul in the dimension of the emotions, when I talked about those three dimensions of the soul. I know this is like drinking from a fire hose. I'm sorry. It just there's no other way to do it. So the Lord confronts it, but as soon as he confronts it, right, he says, what have you done? Adam goes, well, the woman did it. And then the woman says, well, the snake did it. So it's just pass the buck down the line. So blame shifting is, is usually something that we see as a, a component or a lived reality in people who are struggling with uh, this kind of uh, problem, blame shifting. And, of course, the relationships begin to suffer, right? Adam and Eve in particular, they, whereas before she'd come right out of his side and he says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, it's like she did it. Well, anyone ever been married? I rest my case. So their physical lives become affected because now they're mortal and they're going to experience pain and sweat and, again, eventually physical death. That's recorded in chapter 3, verses 16 and 19. And not only that, their entire environment changes because they were banished from the Garden of Eden and with it from the, uh, the presence of the Lord, and they had now to live in a sin-cursed world. Now, God does have mercy on them, and he uh, spares them, but the, 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 the die has been cast, and literally at this time, in 2023, we are still living the effects of that in our world today. And of course, it's worse now because we've had millennia to uh, compound with our own sin, the sin that comes to us from our forefathers and foremothers, Adam and Eve. All right, let's take a look at another one. Um, this is in Genesis chapter 25, and this one's the story of Esau. So in this story, uh, there's multiple parts to it, but in Genesis chapter 25, um, Jacob and Esau have been born. They were wrestling in the womb. Uh, Rebekah inquires of the Lord, why am I having these children struggling within me? And the Lord said to her, there are two nations in your womb, and two peoples are within you, uh, and you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. And so she now understands that Oh, uh, there's two twins and they're wrestling, and what they're doing now is what they will do forever, which is literally true. Esau becomes the nation of Edom, and Edom today is uh, that that land, that territory, is um, the southern end of Jordan and the northern end of Saudi Arabia, and all you have to do is look at the conflict in the Middle East, and you can see that this is still being played out. But anyway, when they grow up, Esau is a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob's a quiet man dwelling in tents. So once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom, which means red. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. And Esau said, I'm about to die of what you... Uh, is a birthright to me. And Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. And thus Esau despised his birthright. Well, this is really where it begins. Um, as I said, the, the birth of Esau and Jacob was prophetic of their later struggles and conflicts, but it was really Esau's appetite that led him into temptation. Very similar to Eve, right? She looked on the fruit, saw that it was pleasing to the eye. She reaches out and touches it. It's pleasing in the hand. She tastes it. It's pleasing for food. <coughs> so all of this same dynamic 
And as it happens in Esau's story, it revolves around food. It doesn't always revolve around food, though, and I think most of us recognize that uh, natively. It, it could involve many other things beyond food. Anyway, the Scripture says he sinned in despising his birthright. Now, this passage didn't say that, but in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, it does say that, and that's found in verses 15 to 17. Again, I, it would be helpful to read it, but I'm minding the clock, and if I turn to every one of these, we won't get out of here till midnight or something, and you'll all hate me. And then you'll have sin sickness. <laughs> all right, so, um, so he binds himself with an oath. Um, Jacob says, swear to me, and he says it to him twice, because evidently Esau's a little bit hesitant to do it, but in the end he's like, hey, I am going to die, so what the heck, I'll just let it go. So there, there's danger in oath-breaking. Let me just say that. This is a key ministry technique and tool that we, that we use when we minister to people with sin sickness. Jesus talks about how we shouldn't take oaths and how we shouldn't swear by uh, the temple or by heaven or so on. Shouldn't swear by the earth, it's God's footstool. But this business of taking oaths, um, and, and I'm not talking about when you go into a courtroom. I'm talking about taking oaths to bind yourself to something or to somebody in a situation like this, in a transactional nature. Um, th I have seen so many cases where people needed to have that oath-breaking exercise uh, terminated. So um, does anyone remember the scene in Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, when Aragorn uh, goes down and he finds all those ghosts that are living like in the underground world? Well, there's a line in the book that I can't remember, but I think they didn't put it in the movie. But he goes there to summon them to help him fight against all that Mordor has. And in the book, The Return of the King, he says to them, oath breakers, why have you come? And they've come to kill him, but he has the upper hand because he has not broken any oaths. And this thing of breaking oaths, I really can't stress how big of a deal this is. I've got story after story after story of people who have done this. It might be something as ordinary as a marriage oath. It might be something far more serious where they took some sort of a blood oath, maybe as part of an initiation ritual, perhaps into a fraternity, maybe the Freemasons, whatever. But they took an oath, and in order to be freed of whatever this thing is that's now assailing them, the fact that they broke the oath has to be dealt with. It is a form of sin sickness. Now, for a lot of you, that's a shocking idea. And if you've been raised with the mentality that it was all done at the cross, so no matter what I do, Jesus is going to cover it over with his blood, it's not that he can't cover it, it's that it's not automatic. And so these things have to be disclosed, they have to be addressed, and then freedom can come. So Esau has bound himself with an oath, and he is later characterized in the book of Hebrews as a godless person for this reason. Now, I guess he probably had some knowledge of God, but he did not have a reverence for God. And notably, the covenant passes down not through Esau's line, even though he's the elder brother. It passes down through Jacob's line because he is the one who has the favor of the Lord. I think God in his foreknowledge knew that Jacob would be the one who... Jacob was a bit of a shifty guy too, but he at least had a fundamental fear of the Lord and knew him and acknowledged him. And that seemed to improve, by the way, through his life. He, he was not so good in his early years, and he got better over time. Well, Esau ends up holding a grudge against Jacob for what he had done. And um, so he, the Scripture says that he held these things in his heart, and he determined that he would kill his brother Jacob. It says in Genesis 27, 41, Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Now when you're harboring that in your heart, all kinds of things are going to go wrong. And I'll just give you a very quick synopsis of a story that really bears much longer telling of a man I prayed for in Sydney, Australia, about six or seven, maybe eight years ago. And uh, he, was a, he was a Christian man. He was a Jewish Christian man. And he had been in the Lord for about 25 years. 
And I want to emphasize this. He was a Christian man. But he, as a Jewish man, he had been raised in Russia. He had been persecuted in Russia, and his family had fled. They'd gone to Italy, where they'd run into more trouble, so they'd fled. They'd gone to Israel, where they ran into trouble with Arabs, and they fled. He came to Australia, and he finally found a place where he could find peace. Almost everything that came out of this man's mouth was some sort of a criticism or a snide remark or some sort of something against Russians, Italians, and especially Arabs, especially Arabs. And it was just this nonstop stream of venom. And uh, the reason that he wanted prayer, and this goes back to my comment of this, the problem is usually not the problem. He thought his problem was polycystic kidneys. But his problem wasn't polycystic kidneys. His problem was that he had hatred in his heart for these three categories of people. And as it happened, it's a very compressed version of the story. It's far more dramatic when I tell it with all the ins and outs of how it unfolded. But as it happened, he, um, he was a businessman, and he had gotten in a deal over some auto parts and automotive financing paper with another man who happened to be Italian. And so, you know, we'd been praying with him for about three hours. Remember what I said about your time is going to be stolen away and it will no longer be your own? So I'm just warning you up front, I really mean this. You, you will not succeed in this ministry without letting the Lord reprioritize your calendar. And most of us are very self-focused with our calendars. So uh, anyway, we're sitting there praying. It's about hour three into this five-hour ministry session. And I get a word from the Lord. And I, I turn to him. He's sitting here on my right. And uh, my, my other daughter, not this one, is right in front of him on her knees on the floor. And his pastor is just on the other side of him. And I said, um, did you have a, some sort of a conflict with an Italian man about automotive parts and automotive finance paper? And this guy lifts up his head. He looks at me. And then he looks at his pastor, and his pastor says, I didn't tell him anything, and I told you you were going to have to deal with this. <laughs> this literally happened. And then I looked at him, and I said, wait a minute. You hired a contract killer to murder him. And he said to me, this is a Christian man in the Lord for 25 years. He said to me, it was cheaper than hiring a lawyer. It's literally what he said. There's a lot of ways to solve problems in the world. I wouldn't have thought of that one, but anyway. <laughs> I said, did you have him killed? He said, no, I paid the, the contract killer $2,500 to basically take the job, and he's waiting for me to tell him where and when to finish it, and then I've got to pay the balance. And I said, well, let me be clear. You're never paying the balance of that. And I said, let me just tell you something. Jesus said, if you look at a woman with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery. I said, if you hired a contract killer, you are guilty of murder. That's literally what I said to him. It may not sound compassionate, but he needed to, like, wake up. What are you doing? And I said, I want you to repent of the sin of murder in your heart. And when he did, this ball of gray stuff about this big came up out of his gut and, of course, you can only open your mouth about, aha. So the ball's bigger than the mouth, but it was phlegmy and squishy, and so it kind of squeezed through his mouth, and it, it ejected from his mouth with a loud kind of sound, and it was coming right at my daughter, who, <laughs> who had the trash can and held it up, and you could hear it go thunk in the bottom of the can. And his polycystic kidneys were healed. Now, I'm telling you that story because I want you to see the profound effects of sin in a human body. If it's dealt with, it can, be, it can be healed. If it's not dealt with, it will never go away. People say you can't heal polycystic kidneys. It's just a fatal condition and you'll eventually die. Well, wrong. Jesus has a better answer. So we can turn these things around, but you do need some revelation and you do need to take these matters seriously that I'm talking about. Esau had a grudge against Jacob, and he determined to murder his brother. That's what's going on. And so maybe he had a spirit of murder. It doesn't say that, but knowing how things work, it's likely. 
All right, so the thought of murder was the only way Esau could console himself, handle his self-pity, and all of this shows the effect that it had on his emotional state. So his sin in the spirit is now impacting the soul realm, and it's causing him to have fallen thinking around murder. Who else committed murder early on in the stories in the Bible? Cain. And a similar reason, right? So he's got fallen thinking, he's got emotional problems going on, and his will is being corrupted. All three dimensions of his soul, we'll get into this more tomorrow when we talk about inner healing, um, all three dimensions of his soul are being corrupted because of this fundamental sin sickness which he himself is guilty of. And so uh, when he can't get a hold of Jacob because he'd fled, now he turns around, and the Scripture tells us in uh, Genesis 28 that he retaliated against his father and his mother. Now, he doesn't kill them, but the way he does it is he uh, rebels by marrying some of the local women who don't honor the Lord God, and he goes off and has these wives that are that are not God-fearing wives. And what does that do? It cements him into a matrix of relationships. He has two wives. In those years, people did that. He has this matrix of relationships that cement him into a godless lifestyle. And while on some level he may have had, again, a knowledge of God, he may have known the name of God, but he had no relationship with God, and his entire life goes basically off the cliff. And the, the kingdom of the Edomites as I say, to this very day remains a, a thorn in the side of the Jews. But when you look at the story of Esau, so deeply entrenched in, their, in the consciousness of this man and of the nation that would arise from him. Remember the word of the Lord was, there are two nations in your womb. So deeply is this entrenched into the nation of Edom that if you read the book of Obadiah, it's a one-chapter prophecy. Obadiah talks about how when the Babylonians came in 586 B.C., so round numbers about 3,000 years later, when the Babylonians came and attacked Jerusalem, there were Jews who fled Jerusalem trying to get away from the Babylonian armies. This is what you would do in those days. Still do it in our time, but when they have a siege ramp around the city, it can be a little hard to get out. But these Jews are fleeing. The Edomites came out and rounded up the fleeing Jews and returned them to the Babylonians for enslavement and execution. It became that deep of an antipathy and an animosity that it affected dozens, arguably more than 100 generations of people coming out of Esau's loins. That's the profound effect that I said, we don't even think about it. Now, you might not know the story of Obadiah. You might not read that part of the Bible, so you wouldn't necessarily know that. But I'm telling you, this is right there in the pages of Scripture, and it's written on a canvas so that all can see it. Now, we don't know exactly how God softened Esau's heart. Um, you know, We know that when Jacob came back, he sent a lot of flocks and offerings ahead trying to appease him, so that might have had something to do with it, maybe. not Can't be sure, but possibly. Uh, but when he meets Esau, by that time, years later, uh, more than 14, took him a while to cool off, um, he had forgiven and he accepted Jacob, and he says, yeah, don't worry about all that. Now let me give you a case study. I at one time was ministering in this church not far from where we live, and uh, for, for many weeks, I went there every week and held a midweek meeting for them, teaching them on these things, and a lot of amazing things were going on. There was a man in that church who was an elder, and he had a, a real problem with anger toward women. He'd been through two marriages, um, and he, he just could not be civil to women. And so he asked if he could meet with me, and in those years, I, I did more individual appointments. I'm so busy now, I don't do many of them anymore, but... Uh, anyway, I met with this guy, and I asked him, so what is it with you and women? Because th this is clearly your issue. And he said, well, you know, my mother was always shaming and belittling me, and my grandmother, who lived with us, was a very controlling woman, and in her own way, she also shamed and belittled me. And um, he had had a boss at one time 
who was a woman, and he didn't make it in that job because he couldn't be civil to her, so she got fired. And then uh, at this time when I met with him, he was a, he was a sales guy, and he had a very large uh, account with Costco Corporation, that Costco that we all shop at. So uh, anyway, th he, had a, he had a counterparty within Costco who was a vice president, and he would have to meet with her and you know, carry on business and negotiate contracts and so forth. And he couldn't be civil to her, and so he had lost a $19 million account with Costco and gotten terminated from his job for that one. So there's a big problem here. Well, as I talked with him about this, I'm always trying to listen to the Lord, not just myself and not just the individual, because again, the problem may not be the problem. And finally, in, as we're meeting, I said to him, um, you know, you, you felt put upon by your mother and your grandmother, and that really engendered bitterness in your heart towards women, I said, you do realize that's sin, don't you? He goes, no. He said, they deserve it. Said, no, 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 hold on. <laughs> this is sin. You're not allowed to harbor a grudge like that. I said, do, do you think you could trust God to be your defender? And when I said that, his entire face flushed red. He goes, no one's ever asked me that question before. I said, well, you've had a problem with mom, grandma, an early boss, a more current boss, and this VP at Costco, I said, isn't that enough evidence for you right there? Now, sometimes you have to be a little bit blunt, but I'm actually trying to be loving. I'm not trying to just, you know, abuse people here. He said, well, you know, a long ago I cursed my mother because of all that she did. I said, well, I guess it's time to take back that curse. And uh, he had one of his marriages had ended because he'd committed adultery just out of spite because he knew it would hurt his wife and that was part of his payback to all the women in his life. You wouldn't know anybody like this, would you? Of course you do. I'm not saying it's you, but of course you do. This stuff is all over. And, and it, by the way, if you don't know anybody like this, just turn on the television and watch Modern American Family. Right? Right? Okay, so with that on the table, this guy went through a profound repentance of the sin that was in his heart toward women. He also got some inner healing and deliverance, but that's not my focus tonight. I don't want to draw us into that. He went through a profound uh, freedom, and, and at the end of that prayer session, he looks at me and he says, I have been in counseling for 20 years, and I have gotten more benefit out of this two hours with you than 20 years of counseling. Well, that's not because I'm so great. It's because what we are doing in a lot of our modern therapeutic babble speak that goes on in wherever it's going on, including in churches, is we are failing to address the very issues that the book addresses. Sometimes it's because we don't know the book well enough, and sometimes it's because we're afraid to go where the book leads us to. But here's the thing. Jeremiah, the prophet, said centuries ago, at, at the time that Jerusalem was about to fall to the Babylonians, he says it in chapter 6, and he says it in chapter 8. I don't remember the verses, but you can look them up. He says the same thing twice. He says, prophet and priest are alike in this. Now, what are prophets? They're people who don't necessarily read from the book. They speak out of inspiration, but they bring the word of the Lord that way. Priests, on the other hand, were the ones tasked with the temple ritual, but they guarded the Torah and they taught from the book. So whether you're speaking under inspiration as what we would say a charismatic or a prophet, or you're a teacher of the word of God, Jeremiah said they are alike, prophet and priest. In this way, they heal the wounds of my people lightly. And if we aren't willing to go where the Bible goes, we won't see people get healed profoundly. Now, we do have to do it with grace and care, with love, which, by the way, mostly looks like gentleness, kindness, and self-control. Those are the three primary facets of love. And incidentally, they all occur in the list of things in um, Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, as well as 1 Corinthians 13. 
which describes love. So we're not just doing this to be able to strut around like a peacock and say, ha, look how I got him. Sometimes you have to say things that are a little bit blunt and in people's face in order to wake them up. Other times you can be very smooth and rounded and kind of bring them along carefully, and it doesn't have to be quite as confrontational. But the point is, we are trying to be therapeutic. We do not want to heal the wounds of God's people lightly. If we do, we will be guilty of the very thing that Jeremiah accused the people of his day of doing. Well, I've got plenty of other stories here. In fact, I've got nine of them, all from the Scripture. And uh, I've got uh, supporting uh, supporting stories from my own life and ministry. I want to give one New Testament example, and then we'll wrap this piece up and uh, get to the prayer time, and we'll move on to other things tomorrow. Um, let's look at the story of... Uh, there's my warning. <laughs> okay, Ken, shut up and get off the pulpit. Um, There's a story in Mark chapter 2, and it's a man who has a palsy. He's sick with a palsy. So let's go to Mark chapter 2. It's a relatively shorter story, 12 verses. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And uh, when, they made, when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now note, he's dealing with sin sickness right there. He said, your sins are forgiven. I'm sure in the moment he probably said which sins, but when Mark was writing this gospel, he didn't record what those were. And it's probably for the good, because otherwise we would woodenly say, oh, every time somebody's paralyzed, it's probably because of that sin. But what the, the learning you can take away is that oftentimes paralysis is grounded in sin. Now, over the years, I've seen well over 400 people who were either quadriplegic or paraplegic or something else uh, paralyzed I've seen them healed, well over 400. And I would say, based on that relatively large sample, that probably something in the neighborhood of two-thirds of them had a sin sickness of some sort that needed to be addressed in order for them to be healed. It was a necessary condition for their healing. Now, what we have to avoid when we say that is the idea, and, and if, if you've been around the charismatic world for any length of time, you might have even been in a Bible study or a church where they're like, you're not healed because you're in sin. And it's always said with that kind of a tone. Um, that's not helpful. <laughs> it's, it's also not kind <laughs> or patient or gentle. Um, and I think what you know, people are, they're, they're, they think they're being profound, but we don't want to leave people in their state of captivity. Our entire point is to liberate people. And so um, there's a lot of times when I'll go into churches and people will say to me that somebody who thought they were prophetic had walked up to them and they were told, um, the Lord shows me there's sin in your life. And then they walk away. And then, so then that person is talking to me and they're like, what do you think of that? And I always say, that's crap prophecy. Because the whole nature of, of our ministry is to set people free. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to set at liberty the oppressed, recovery of sight to the blind, and to declare the year of the Lord's favor. So there should always be something redemptive in it. And so anybody can say there's sin in your life. You could say it about me right now, right? I could point at you or you and say, you know, you've got sin in your life. Of course you have sin in your life. But that doesn't help me get free of it. So... Don't, don't give me a prophecy like that unless you're going to show me the way out of this thing. All right, so this man, uh, they bring him. Jesus sees their faith. He says to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like this? He is blaspheming. Who can give, forgive sins but God alone? Now, 
if you are used to reading the Scripture for theology or doctrine, you'll take that and you'll say, see, this proves Jesus is the Son of God because he can forgive sins. And that's true, but for purposes of learning to heal people, that's not helpful because you aren't the Son of God, nor will you ever be. So to, to make that observation doesn't help you get better in your healing skills. It's doctrinally correct. It's just not helpful for what we're trying to do right now. All right, so immediately Jesus perceiving in his spirit, so he has a word of knowledge, that they thus questioned within themselves, he said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up, uh, rise, take up your bed and walk? Well, the answer to that is obvious. It's easier to say your sins are forgiven because you can't measure it. John Wimber used to say most of the church is playing basketball without hoops. So, you know, you can, wow, really impressive. But did you score? Oh, there's no hoop. But if the ball goes through the hoop, you know it's scored, and if it misses, then it's not a score. So he's, answer, he's asking this question, and then he says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And again, we could use that doctrinally, but now we're going to use it in a healing way. He turns back to the paralytic, and he says, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. I'm going to prove to you that what you think is the, hard, is the easy thing, I can do that one just because I can also do the hard one. So with that, we'll just end that conversation. That's really what he's doing with the Pharisees. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Well, Jesus forgave this man's sins before he declared him healed. And so this is a very good example of how a sin sickness could actually be interfering with a healing. Now again, we don't know what this man's sin was, just that he had a sin problem of some kind. And Jesus saw that this spiritual sickness was in fact the, uh, the main issue. So again, back to my early comment that what people think is the problem isn't always the problem. Everybody there thought the problem was the man can't walk. This man's problem wasn't that he couldn't walk. His problem was that he had this sin issue of whatever sort it was. By the way, I'm not going to turn there, but if you look in John 5, it's a comparable kind of conversation. It's not identical, but in John 5, when Jesus goes to the pool of Bethesda, that man is lying there for 38 years, Everybody's waiting for the angel to stir the waters, and the first one in gets healed. Jesus says, do you want to be well? And the man says, well, I don't have anyone to help me. I've been here for 38 years, and every time the water is stirred, I'm the last guy in, so I, I, don't, I don't get the, you know, the bonus that comes because you've got to be the first guy in. And so he's kind of going on and on and on, and Jesus basically cuts him off, and he says, stop it. Pick up your mat and go home. But, you know, it's interesting Immediately after that, the story continues, Jesus finds him in the street and he says, stop sinning or something worse may befall you. Now, what was the man's sin? We don't know, but from the interaction, it sounds like he probably was bitter, maybe a grumbler. Grumbling is specifically called out in 1 Corinthians 10 as a sin. So it could be any number of things like this. Uh, but whatever that man's problem was, it is clear that the man had a sin sickness problem, and what do you know? He's another paralyzed guy. Remember what I said about something around two-thirds of people who have these kinds of problems have sin problems. But you've got to figure out what is that. Again, you're becoming a diagnostician. So the interesting thing with that man, I've thought about this a lot, and I've been to the Pool of Bethesda Pretty much every time I go to Israel, I go there, and uh, I've gone way down into the very depths of it because there's a cistern down there and gotten the water and, you know, the whole nine yards. I'm very interested in the Pool of Bethesda. <clears throat> um, but, you know, Jesus says to him, stop sinning or something worse will befall you. How about just this one? Stop sinning or you might get sick again. You might lose your healing. And if it comes back on you, just like when one demon comes out, but it brings seven worse, your final state might actually worsen. So every opportunity, every engagement with the Lord becomes an opportunity 
to, I would say, improve your spiritual state, to deal with things you haven't dealt with, to become more earnest and ardent and thorough about what you're doing. So let me tell you a story of this in play. Um, maybe it was mm, probably near 10 years ago. Uh, we went to Mexico, and we were, we were visiting various places, and we went to this town in the Yucatan Peninsula. Anna, were you on this trip with me? Were this, I thought you were. Um, so we go to this town in the Yucatan Peninsula, and it's deep in Mayan territory. It's not a very big town. I could tell you the name, but A, you, you wouldn't recognize it, and B, I, I don't know where this is being broadcast, so I'll just leave it at this. But anyway, we go to this town, and uh, the, the guy that I was working with in Mexico, he and buildings and carpeting and whatever, it's, you know, it's a relatively poor area, so $50,000 will go a long way. And they'd put this money in over a period of years. They'd built relationships. They'd gone out there. They'd preached and you know, ministered and blah, 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 blah. So anyway, they had asked for me to come, and so we'd gone there. And when we show up in the, uh, in the auditorium, uh, they were definitely running on Mexican time, uh, <laughs> as we like to joke. It's probably not allowed to say that either, so forgive me if it sounded racist. Um, anyway, we start the meeting late, but there's a man sitting over here, and he's a quadriplegic, and he's in a wheelchair, and some of the team run over to try to pray for him. They want to see this quadriplegic get healed, and it, when, you, when you start getting into this healing thing, it, it's almost like playing brick breaker or whatever your favorite thing is, and you're you know, I, I want to get my first blind eye. I want to get my first deaf ear. I want to get my first, you know, cripple. So some of them run over to this crippled guy, and not much happens. So they ask me if I'll come over and help pray for him. And so I'm walking over, and as I look at him, I see written over his head the word usury, U-S-U-R-Y. Letters were about this big, about so thick, just like that. And I know what usury is. Do you? Okay, some people do, some people don't. It's the charging of ex excess interest. It's forbidden in Scripture. Uh, it's, it's also taught about in the Catholic Catechism. So I walk over to him, and I'm thinking, how am I going to use this word of knowledge that the Lord has given me with this man? But what I do know already is if usury is in this guy's life, this is a sin sickness. Right? Because he's violating the Scriptures, and... I already have this kind of working paradigm that not all, but a lot of paralysis has something like this in its root. So I walk over and I said, start talking to him, and I said, um, were you raised Catholic? And he says, oh yeah, of course I was. In southern Mexico, you kind of, you idiot. <laughs> it wasn't that I didn't suspect that, it was more of a leading question, but anyway. Uh, so I said, do you remember what they taught you in the Catholic Catechism about usury? No. I said, do you, do you know what usury is? No. I said, it's the charging of excessive interest. Have you ever lent any money to anybody? He says, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I have. Um, some years ago, I borrowed a large sum of money from somebody, and I broke it into 10 pieces, and I re-lent it to 10 individuals. I said, oh, what happened with that? And he said, well, nine of them paid me back. Okay. And I said, what about the tenth? He said, well, he hasn't paid me back. Okay. And what have you done about that? And he says, well, um, I sent some of my guys around to beat him up. Sin sickness, right? Think of the guy with the polycystic kidneys. Okay. Different, different thing. Not, not killing him, but, but roughing him up and putting fear into him. I said, anything else? He said, well, I kidnapped his two daughters. And I said, you did what? He said, yeah, I, I, I had his two daughters kidnapped. I said, were they harmed? He said, no, we returned them. I said, intact and completely unharmed? Because this is southern Mexico. People play rough, right? Just drug cartels, the whole thing. And, and he goes, totally fine. I said, nobody touched them sexually? No. I said, how long did you keep him? Well, several days. Okay, so that kidnapping. So we've got you know, physical assault. We've got kidnapping. Does this guy have a sin problem? Yeah. 
Has he ever talked about it with anybody? No. And has anyone even thought to ask about it? No. So I said, well, what else? Well, I threatened to burn his house down. Oh, arson, that's good. That'll put that one on the list too. Okay, so, and there was a fourth one. I don't remember what it was. But anyway, he had these four things. And I said, if you will repent of these sins, Jesus will heal you right now. I said, are you willing to turn away from all of this and let the remaining money go with no further repayment? Just whatever you've gotten is what you've gotten. You made it back on the first nine loans and whatever you've recovered of this tenth one. But are you willing to let that go? He said, if Jesus will get me out of this chair, and he'd been in that chair, I think it was three years. <clears throat> Maybe it was longer. I can't remember now. But anyway, is it in my notes? No. Uh, I said, will, will you forsake all of this? And he said, yes, if Jesus heals me, I will do that. And I said, now listen to me. I'm going to be leaving tomorrow. And I said, I won't be around to check in on you. But I said, if you make a vow before the Lord right here, I said, the scripture says he will send his angel to collect the vow. Do you guys know that? Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And the scripture says, when you go into the house of God, guard your lips. God takes no pleasure in fools. It is better not to vow than to vow rashly. I said, so listen to me. If you decide to do this and you go back on it, I'm telling you, the wrath of God will fall on your head. I don't know what it'll be and I won't be around but I'm just telling you, you better think about this before you do it. He goes, no, no, I'm, you know, I'm willing to do it. So, uh, so anyway, I have him repent of all of these things. And then I just said, get out of that chair and walk. And he came right out of that chair and walking in front of the room. And everybody in the, in the village, in the city, knew who he was. The place went crazy. And then, like, heaven opened. And, you know, people, like, we just had this breakout of healings and deliverances and everything else because of that one healing. But that man was bound to that wheelchair because of these sins in his life. And so, again, we're called to set people free. So I wasn't trying to condemn him. I was just uncovering the roots that were there because if you get the root, you will get the bitter, unpleasant fruit up here on the tree. And that one is probably one of the very best stories I have of an amazing breakthrough victory rooted in that idea. And we see that same kind of thinking going on in this man that had the palsy that was lowered through the roof, and we also see it with the man by the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. All right, let's summarize this and we'll call it a night. Um, at salvation, our spirits are made alive by God's Spirit. We are literally made as new creations. So 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man or woman is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone, all things are become new. So on the one hand, we are spiritually healed, but here's what often happens. People don't really do a thorough job of repenting. Uh, they just, nowadays, especially in America, we, we give an altar call, we say, hey, if you want to meet Jesus, come on up here and pray. And we pray some banal prayer like, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins, please forgive me and let me go to heaven, amen. We say, praise God, you're born again. Well, might be true, but all that debris of all those accumulated years, of all those misdeeds, none of that's been addressed at all. And then we just tell people, don't worry about it, it was all done at the cross. Anyone ever heard that? Okay, and so what's happening is we are doing what Jeremiah said. We are healing the wounds of God's people lightly by not getting into the depths of this stuff. And, uh, you know, it's a little bit like anyone here ever had a root canal? Okay, so, you know, you get this problem with your tooth. Now, there's a lot of ways you can have problems with your teeth that are, that are cavities, right? On the one hand, you can get a cavity that's pretty shallow, and, you know, you, you go in for your cleaning or whatever, your checkup, and the dentist gets out that curved pick thing, and the dentist is kind of pressing into the enamel of your tooth. Mm, 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 mm. And you're like, I don't like the sound of that. And you, don't worry about this. This isn't going to hurt a bit. And he gets out the drill, or she, and because it's a shallow one, he doesn't even anesthetize, and you're like, ah, ah, and, but you don't really feel it because it's right up there on the cervix. You feel the vibration, but nothing more and you're done. Okay, when that's all you need, that's all you need. And sometimes when people have issues in their lives, that's all they need. I'm, I'm using this to illustrate the idea of sin. Okay, there'll be other times when, mm, 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 yeah, so out comes the needle, and you're like, ah! <laughs> and they, they smear that stuff on your gum to try and numb it a little bit, and then 
they stick it in, and then he's and you feel your gum like it's going to explode, right? So you've got all that pain, but then the Novocaine kicks in, and okay, now the it's it's numb, and you're all right. And so, <laughs> feeling around, yeah, okay, not too bad. They fill the tooth, you go home. But then there's that other one. Ooh, not good. Okay, I'm going to numb you a little bit, and I'm going to give you a first shot, but then I'm going to give you a second shot that, that you couldn't get until the first numbing has taken over, and so you go through this whole thing, and you're like, <sighs> but now your mouth is totally numb, and then they get out this drill that's like, you know, <laughs> and they, so they finish up with that, and then they get this wire, right, and they stick the wire way down in your tooth. He pulls it out. He's checking it, holding up the light. And I'm going to need to do more. <laughs> you're sitting there. Thank God you're, you're numb, right? But, <laughs> so, but then they got to do that not just to one root, but to two or three. Some, root, some teeth have four roots. And every now and then there's one with five. And here's the problem. If you leave one of those roots not drilled and then filled, you know what you're going to get? A bigger problem called... Someone just said it over here, yeah, abscess. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about when people come to the Lord, we need to do a thorough clean out of all the stuff in their lives. And most Christians in America today need a spiritual root canal. Yes, they do. Especially in our culture. Why? Because almost everybody has used drugs. That alone would be enough reason. And now we've legalized marijuana, and people in the church are saying, well, it's okay because it's legal, right? Well, so is homosexual marriage, and that's not okay. Are you following my logic? Yeah, it's acceptable. So we've got people that have come in, and they've been in the drug world. They've been drunks and alcoholics. They've had 48 sexual partners at whatever level they've had sexual partners. Maybe it wasn't all full-on intercourse, but whatever they've been doing, They've been doing that. And maybe they went up to San Francisco and they went on their spiritual journey in the Haight-Ashbury or they went off to India and they were trekking, you know, and they went up to some ashram. And just everybody today has this long string of stuff. There was a time in America, in my lifetime, I remember this America, where that wasn't so much the case. People were kind of raised in Christian homes. They knew right from wrong. And even if they didn't really believe in the Lord, they knew enough not to do that stuff because it was not socially acceptable. Our social norms were set up based on Christianity, and people knew not to do it. Now we're like, yeah, anything goes, and it's all good, and so people are just off the cliff. So virtually everybody in America has a problem with sin sickness that has never been cleaned out because their repentance was about this deep when they got saved. That's, that's really the truth. So depending on the depth of our repentance when we got saved, we may be born again, but we may have this tooth that's abscessing, to go back to that metaphor, that illustration I gave. And so sickness of spirit can take hold of us again. And now maybe it's through willful sin or unconfessed sin or bondage to sin or neglect of our relationship with God and his people. Many of these things go on. And sickness of the spirit begins to intrude and corrupt other areas of our lives. Maybe our mental health, maybe our emotional health, our bodies. We may have demons attached to all this. We may have social problems, on and on. So how do we deal with this? Well, number one, the sin has to be addressed. Now, when I say addressed, I'm going to use the word confront. But for a lot of people, confront sounds like you know, you're really angry and you want to get up people's nose and like... Yeah. I don't mean that, but, but we have to bring it into the light. We've got to say, you know, do you realize that what you're doing here is actually not okay? Like, kind of like I did with that man in Australia who'd hired a contract killer. He actually didn't know. He was so hardened in his mind, he actually didn't know that what he was doing was wrong. It, it, I mean, he did know objectively, but it didn't occur to him the depth of what he was doing. And so that's why I had to be as blunt as I was and say, look, if you look at a woman with lust, you're committing adultery. If you hire a contract killer, you're a murderer. So we confront the sin and we, we show people why it's wrong from the Word of God. And, and it's an important part of what we do when we admonish people. And this doesn't go on in the modern church because typically 
A, we don't know, and B, if we do, if we tell anybody, hey, you got a problem here, they're going to stalk out of the church angry and they're going to leave because people today are willful and unteachable. This is just true. And Paul even said that in the last days, people would gather to themselves teachers who would say whatever their itching ears want to hear. We've come to that time. Okay, so once this thing has been addressed or confronted, second step, a prayer of confession. Now, this isn't just, oh, Jesus, I'm sorry I got caught. This is, Jesus, I realize that what I have done is offensive in your eyes and in the eyes of the Father, and I want to turn from this with everything that is within me. If you will give me the strength, I will never do this again, so help me, God, and I will keep this to my dying day. It doesn't need to be that verbiage, but it sure needs to be that intention. However they pray it, they need to have that kind of force behind the prayer. Third step, I'm telling you how to do this. Third step, John 20, 23, Jesus said to his disciples, not just the apostles, his disciples, in the upper room, just before he ascends, but he's, it's, it's after the resurrection, he says, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. And so with that, we... As priests, because the scripture says we are a nation of priests unto the Lord, we as priests administer forgiveness. I forgive you for the sin of hiring a contract killer. And in the name of Jesus, you are absolved. I have no power to do this. But as a priest mediating the grace of God, I do have that power. And I have seen many times just speaking those words over somebody, they just break down into a mush pot of tears. They're just completely wrecked as they come into contact with the mercy and the forgiveness of God, and they realize, I can actually get out of this thing that I've been caught in I didn't even know how to get out of. All right, step four, they now receive the forgiveness you've just pronounced, and I just described that. And then step five, as appropriate, so this won't apply in every case, but it will apply in some cases. As appropriate, there needs to be necessary acts or appropriate acts of repentance and restitution. We don't do that one much either. We just figure, well, you know, you, sold, you stole 50,000 bucks from somebody, no big deal. No, you better come up with a plan for repaying all of that money. Well, how am I going to do that and buy my house? I guess you're going to live in an apartment for a while. Simple. Well, but everybody's entitled to a house, yeah, once they earn it. So, again, this is a little bit tough-minded for the modern sentiment, but this is the way it rolls. Okay, so step one, we confront the sin. Step two, uh, we have them pray a prayer of confession. You might need to lead them in that prayer, giving them language, because they may not know how to articulate that. So if they don't, just say, repeat after me, and you can lead them in that prayer. Step three, declare forgiveness to the individual using the keys of John 20, 23, forgiving them of the sin. Step four, let them experience that forgiveness. Don't rush this. Sometimes people will stay in that state of, you know, that pouring out of the Spirit over them. That might go on for 20 or 30 minutes. They're sobbing, they're shaking, they're vibrating under the Spirit. Great, just ride it. Don't, don't be in a rush. In America today, we are always in a rush and we're very uncomfortable with emotion. And a lot of churches will not, you know, they see somebody falling apart and they want to immediately, out comes the Kleenex Brigade, and then the next thing we do is rush them out the door. So don't make that mistake. Just let it be and let it happen. Let everybody around you be offended. They need to see it anyway. You know, somebody in the Bible cried a lot and all of the people around them, that person who were religious were offended. Her name was Mary. And she wept at Jesus' feet after pouring out that, that ointment on his feet. And everybody who was religious was offended at it. And Jesus said, leave her alone. She's done a beautiful thing for me. So we've got to change church culture if we're going to live as a healing community. And the first thing we've got to do is stop being offended at emotion. All right, and then finally, any acts of repentance that may be needed. And uh, with all of this will come healing to the Spirit and an opening to heal related maladies on various levels. Their relationship with God will be restored and uh, growth will begin occurring in various areas of that person's life. Now, let's be clear. Many people have more than one sin that they may need to get clear of. That's, that's real. 
Um, so you might have a series of prayer sessions with an individual as you clean out all of the roots in the root canal that you are performing, um, and that's okay. That's, that's part of the process of Christian healing and Christian maturity and discipleship, uh, but it does come to an end. It's not an ongoing forever thing. Believe it or not, all of us have a finite set of sins we've committed, and you know, at some point we will have repented of all of it and taken care of it well. But you'd be shocked at the people who will get, start getting free of things when these kinds of matters are addressed. So again, this first category is healing of the, of the spirit. It deals with uh, sin sickness. That sickness may or may not be physical, but it is absolutely rooted in the sin that they themselves committed once upon a time, and uh, it needs to be cleaned out. Now, tomorrow we'll talk about what happens when sin is committed against you. That's a slightly different thing, uh, but again, I'm trying to break these into very distinct and clear blocks so that you can track what I'm talking about. And with that, I'm done talking for now. And so... Uh, I will take a question or two, but I don't want to get too bogged down in questions. We'll do some more of that tomorrow. But if there's anything that wasn't quite clear about what I said, this would be a good chance to bring it up. Yeah, usually the best way to bring something like that up with, with an individual like that is to ask questions. Statements tend to be very blunt, in your face, provocative. But, you know, you see something going on, you might say, you know, when that happened, and sometimes it's better to wait an hour next day, next week. You know, the other day when we were together and this happened, what was happening inside of you at that time? What do you mean? Well, here's the way I remember what happened. I said this, you said that, that other person that was in the room with us, they said this, and then all of a sudden you did this. What was, what was going on when you did that? I've never really thought about it. Well, look, can, can we talk about that? Ask for permission. That's very helpful. Well, why do we need to go there? Uh, well, because you keep talking about how your life is stuck, it isn't working, and I view that as part of what isn't working. And so if you want to get your life unstuck, we probably need to talk about that. And I might even say something like this. You know, think of a fruit tree. If you want to cut off the fruit that you don't want, you got to dig up the root or cut the root. And so I'm trying to figure out what's the root that's below ground that isn't even visible that's causing that to be part of your world. They may or may not receive it, but at least it won't be viewed as, as belligerent. That's the other thing you learn to do if you're going to be a good healer, is you learn to ask good questions in ways that are non-offensive. And it is a learned skill, and most of us don't have it developed well enough, because actually our society encourages us to be obnoxious, rude, and uncouth. And all you have to do is look at the things that get posted on Facebook or Instagram, or listen to Howard Stern, or you know, pick whoever you want, but we are literally cultivating this in our society. And the scripture says that the, the, the servant of the Lord must not strive. We're not to be people who are given to anger and uh, provocation. We're to be peacemakers. And, and I, I really think that the vast majority of the church really needs to take that deeply to heart and start becoming peacemakers, even at the cost of being offended personally or being stepped on. Because it says when Jesus, when they brought reviling accusation against him, what did he do? He answered not in kind, and he turned the other cheek. And we don't teach that in our churches. If you're going to be a healing person, you will have to learn to do that, which is what he did. So this, when we talk about healing, it's more than a series of techniques. It's an entire lifestyle and an attitude of soul. Okay, yes, in the back. Person that, you know, has some, something wrong. 
as a practical matter, it's probably helpful to break it down into two steps. Um, but I will say this, in the history of the church, <clears throat> confession always carried with it the idea that you didn't just acknowledge you'd done it wrong, but that you would cease doing it in the future. And so it, it, the term itself, confession, as it, again, as is it's classically used in Christian theology, is a comprehensive term that includes all angles of that. But in our world today, that might not be obvious to people, so we may need to make it obvious by creating it yet another step to make sure it's done well. Yeah, good question. Yes. Uh, the kind of paralysis I'm describing is not <clears throat> things like MS or muscular dystrophy. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, my throat's closing down. ALS, uh, generally not going to be that. Uh, and it's generally not going to be caused by organic conditions like, you know, I fell down a staircase, broke my vertebrae, and now I'm, you know, paralyzed wherever below that vertebrae. So if it's up here, I might be a quad. If it's a little lower, I might be a paraplegic. Uh, but it's generally not going to be that. That's a different way of healing with that, that type of a situation. So by the way, I have a, I have a whole school online. Um, and then we have interactive groups that train uh, beyond the lectures that are online. And then we do monthly webinars where people can ask questions like this. And sometimes I do other things too. But, but Question and answer is a big part of what we do in those webinars. Um, so if you're interested in finding out more about that school and getting further training, uh, again, we have sheets of paper on the table. Just grab one, use the QR code, or sign on at the website. It's orbissm.com, different from my regular website. You can interlink between the two, but the one that takes you straight to the school is orbissm for School of Ministry. Uh, dot com, and uh, you can do it from your own home. You don't need to take time off work or anything to participate in it. And uh, most of the people that travel with me these days are in the school and you know learning this methodology. And so we talk about these ways of kind of breaking down, okay, which kind of paralysis in your question are we talking about? Uh, so with this, what we're talking about is the kind of paralysis that has um, an onset with no apparent reason. And there are a lot of people who have that. You know, it's interesting on this point, I have a cousin, I'm very close with her, and uh, for many years in her youth, she was paralyzed. And nobody could figure out what was wrong. And her problem was that her father was a brutish man. He was a Christian man too, a good Baptist deacon. Uh, but he was a brutish man. He never sexually abused her, he was just a brute. And uh, he, he, was, he was caustic toward her mother and in response to all of that, because of her anger and unforgiveness toward her father, she became paralyzed. Now, we didn't have any language for any of this. We didn't, we didn't read the scriptures the way I've been doing it tonight in those years. It's just, so my whole family, we kind of scratched our heads and like, what's happening with Susie? How come she's paralyzed? And what's going on? And people prayed and asked God to heal Susie, and nothing happened. And then later on, um, she started to both get counseling and also recognize that she had an issue with her father. And she just realized theologically, I can't hate my father. That's not okay. And so she chose to forgive him, and she got healed without anybody really doing anything. But it, again, it shows you the power of these concepts. And I said early on in this talk tonight that we don't really grapple with the profundity of sin and what it does to us mentally, physically, emotionally, and so forth. Um, but my own cousin is a really, really good example of this in play. All right, so I think we're about done. Uh, let's pray and let. Oh, yeah, hi. Sorry, didn't mean to overlook you.
figuring out which group is still trying to hold it. Just specifically, what would you do next to that person if you were getting any voice feedback? Well, it's a, it's a good question and it's a multi-layered answer. She's asking, what do you do if you're praying for somebody you're not getting anywhere? How do you approach that? There, we've got three other dimensions of healing we're going to talk about tomorrow. And sometimes we get off on the wrong foot. We think it's a sin sickness, but it's not. It's something where they've been sinned against. Or uh, maybe there's a demon there and we need to you know, address the evil spirit. So there can be other things that we may have overlooked or not realized. And so when I'm not getting anywhere with it, there's an old saying, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So I know I've got to change direction somehow. And with that, I'll just pray and say, Lord, what, what, what direction should I go with this? And I'll just pray it in my mind. Uh, sometimes I'll pray it aloud, depends on what's going on, but more often it'll just be in my mind. And I'll just listen and see where is he directing me to go with this now. And then I'll start praying in that direction. And so I... But the other thing that is a reality for me at this point is I've been doing this long enough that I usually have a pretty good sense of what is likely causing something. And I don't usually cover this in a seminar like this one, but I'll do it here because it's on the table and this is a good place to talk about it. For most of the conditions in life anybody can experience, whatever the problem may be, for most of them, there is a defined number of, the word for it is etiologies, so causal sets of factors. And the way I like to say it is in the most general sense, there is an A case, a B case, and a C case. So in the A case, these will be the things that cause it. In the B case, it'll be something, might be somewhat similar or very different, depends on the particular condition we're describing. And then the C case, again, could be very similar or different, some overlap, whatever. Now these numbers are not rigid and strict, but they give you some sense of kind of how I think about it. The A case will usually be roughly 70% of that condition. So you asked about maybe MS or muscular dystrophy. So 70% of the time, these are the things that cause muscular dystrophy. It wouldn't be the same things if you're talking about brittle bones. Okay, that, that would be something altogether different. But still, there'd be an A, B, and C case. And then 20% of the time, it'll be your B case, and maybe 5% of the time, it'll be your C case. And part of what we do in uh, the training that I do through our school is we talk about this, and you know, people start to become aware of what these things are. I'm writing a book on this, but um, unfortunately, my editor was not backing everything up, and it vanished when the computer crashed. Yeah, so we're starting over again. Uh, anyway, but, um, but I will have a book on this because everybody, everybody wants that, like give me the manual. But anyway, if you get this idea of A, B, and C cases, I might redirect and say maybe this is a B case on this problem or a C case on this problem. By the way, for some conditions, maybe there's an A through, I don't know, G. <laughs> it's not A through C. And maybe the percentages change, too. It's not always going to be 70, 20, and 5, which, by the way, I'm aware that only adds up to 95%. <laughs> because the other stuff is the, that last 5% is what I call the dogs and cats. And so, you know, you get these oddball things that are just, you need revelation, you need the Lord to speak, and you, you figure them out. It's not that they're unhealable, it's just that they don't fit these most common cases. But here's the deal. If you know the A, B, and C case for any particular condition, 95% of the time, you can get right on top of that thing, pray into it, and bang, it's going to get healed. Really. And this is learnable, but it's not teachable in an hour, right? Jesus spent three years teaching this to his disciples. And so I will tell you this, everything you need to know about it is right here. But we don't read the book that way because we're reading it doctrinally. Remember when I was talking about Jesus is the Son of God and all that? So we don't we don't read the book that way, and we have to learn to do it. By the way, your richest areas for mining that kind of information are the Psalms, the Proverbs, and the book of Isaiah. So 
you know, just get deep and spend like all of your devotions in those books. And by the way, use a good translation. You can't, you can't get this information by using whatever your favorite paraphrase is. So um, I use the English Standard Version mostly, but I also use occasionally New King James and New American Standard 1995. Don't get the 2020 version that just came out. 1995, thank you very much. If it's not one of those three, don't even need to ask me, what about? No, there's your answer. <laughs> but I really like, no, not for this, not for this kind of work. If you like to read it devotionally, go for it. But if you're trying to mine the Word of God for this kind of information, you need to have an ESV, an NASB 95, or a New King James. That's it. Nobody else need apply. Not even the Passion Translation, as much as I know you all love it. Okay, um, so that you have your A, B, and C case. You could switch cases, but sometimes you might realize, hmm, maybe there's something that needs to happen before we get to this. And I've told the story many times of a woman that I prayed for for five years. And um, <clears throat> I prayed for her maybe eight or nine times a year. She lived in the D.C. area, and she would come to anywhere I was on the East Coast. And she had a problem, and there's a, there's a very distinct medical term for it, uh, Anna, you probably know it at this point, but it's like a 48-letter long word, and it describes cracks and fissures that form in the armpits and in the groin where the legs join the trunk of the body, and you, you ooze pus. And she'd had this condition for years, and no one could solve what it was, and she would come for prayer, and I had tried every single thing I knew, every verse, nothing was working, and I... She, she called me when I was going to be in New York before the pandemic, and she wanted to come for prayer. She always showed up with the same friend to, you know, pray along with us, and I was like, okay, because I'm committed, but I was tired, and I, was, and, I, and I prayed, and I said, Jesus, I got nothing. I, I don't even want to do this anymore because this isn't working, and I don't know what this is going to take. So she shows up at the apartment. And she's sitting on the couch next to me, and I put my hand on her, and I'm starting to pray. And again, I'm, I didn't say it aloud because I didn't want to discourage her or make her feel like she was imposing on me. But I, in my mind, I prayed, and I said, Lord, I really don't want to do this. Please just either heal her or make her stop calling me because I don't want to do this anymore if you're not going to heal her. Now, let me just explain this to you. This has been going on for five years, and I prayed for eight and nine times a year. That's 40, 45 times I prayed for her. And, I mean, this isn't like two-minute prayers. These are like in-depth, will I take time out of my day and give her an hour or two and try and solve this? And, again, I don't do that much of that kind of praying anymore because I'm so darn busy I just don't have time to give to it. But in those years, I was. So, anyway, I sit down. I put my hand on her, this shoulder right here next to me, and the word of the Lord comes to me, and he says, what is pus? What are you talking about? But that was the question he asked me, verbatim. And I said, well, it's, it's white blood cells that are dead. Yeah, and? But see, this is how the Lord leads us sometimes. And... I, I know a lot of things about the circulatory system, the heart, the spleen, the blood from the pages of Scripture, and I know the things that tend to drive diseases in that area, and I, I've seen a lot of healing of those kinds of conditions because of that understanding. And the Lord is speaking to me, and it's not audible, but it is as clear as I am speaking right now. It is absolutely that clear in my head. He says, and... And I'm like, it's, it's dead white blood cells. Why? You know this. Why are you asking me this? But then it, it, the penny dropped, and I went, it's blood. It's white blood. And I knew. I knew what I needed to do because I had all the other un understanding from the Word of God. And so I just prayed a very simple prayer based on, her history, which I knew inside and out, because I'd been praying for her for five years. There was no aspect of her life that had anything to do with anything like this that I didn't know. And so I just very targeted went right into that thing. And she turns and looks at me, and she'd been raised in a very traditional family in Pennsylvania, grew up reading the King James Bible. And she looks at me, and she said, I was just healed. I felt virtue go through my body. 
Now that's what the woman with the issue of blood said. So that's verbatim what she said. I felt virtue go through my body. And I said, are you sure? And she said, I've been healed. Look, and she um, pulls up her arms and she kind of pulls her sh shirt down a bit so you could see her armpit. Now she normally wore pads to soak up and she changed them five times a day because there was so much discharge coming out from you know where her groin was and from where her armpits were. And she pulls off this pad and it looked like somebody had taken a welder's torch and one of those metal rods that welders use and just <laughs> brazed that entire crack. And before that moment, I'd seen it before. She'd shown it to me and she had pictures she'd shown me. The crack was about that long and about that wide. And it looked like it, someone had just took, taken a welder's torch and brazed it closed. And she said, I'm healed. So that night at the meeting, uh, you know, we parted ways and went our, did our afternoon activities. That night at the meeting, she comes in and she goes, by the way, the downstairs looks the same. <laughs> totally healed. Well, I didn't need to see that one. That was... <laughs> but that came because what we need is in the Word of God. And the word of the Lord came to me and gave me what I needed in that moment. Now, maybe it was because I was so desperate that I prayed and I was like, God, please let me out of this. I can't do this anymore. Uh, or maybe I just needed to go through that learning process myself. You know, God's always working on us while we're working on others. But the point is I stayed with it. I didn't give up, and the Lord brought the healing. Now, in our little community of Orbis, um, you know, we've got a lot of people that are we're not a church, but in a lot of ways we function like one. Um, but we have a, a community of people that support one another and pray for one another. And we've got several people who have long-term chronic conditions that we haven't seen healed yet. But I always say yet, yet, because I always think of that woman with her five years. And I'm like, Jesus, I wish you would speed this up, but I know there's a healing out there that we can find it. All right. Now, I was going to do a ministry time, but it's 10 p.m., and my beloved wife and daughter flew here from Texas today, so it's midnight for them, and we have three sessions tomorrow, so we will, we will not do ministry tonight, but all three times tomorrow we will have prayer, so if you need prayer, just come, and I have a prayer team with me. They will assist, and uh, a lot of people are going to get healing this weekend, all right? God bless you all. Thanks for coming out. Tomorrow, 10 a.m.